ولقد آتينا لقمان الحكمة أن اشكر لله ومن يشكر فإنما يشكر لنفسه ومن كفر فإن الله غني حميد وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعظه يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حملته أمه وهنا على وهن وفصاله في عامين أن اشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير وإن جاهداك على أن تشرك بي ما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما فلا تطعهما وصاحبهما في الدنيا معروفا واتبع سبيل من أناب إلي ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون يا بني إنها إن تك مثقال حبة من خردل فتكون في صخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأتي بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وانه عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور ولا تصعر خدك للناس ولا تمش في الأرض مرحا إن الله لا يحب كل مختال فخور وقصد في مشيك واغضب من صوتك إن أنكر الأصوات لصوت الحمير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions, his entire household. May Allah bless them all. And may he bless all those who have brought the goodness to us and may he bless every single one of us and grant us goodness and grant us the ability to spread this goodness and may he grant us all also the ability not only to respect entire humanity but all the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may he make us an asset not only to our families and communities and nations, but to the globe at large. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, this evening the topic I've been given to speak on is advice for a Muslim. And if you notice the recitation that I have chosen just prior or just as I commenced is actually the topic. If we look at Surah Luqman, it is a surah named after a man who was a very wise man in the Quran. If you open the books of Tafsir, you will come across narrations that make mention that this man was not a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he was a wise man worth mentioning in revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of the narrations say he was from a nobah Nawbah is actually an Arabic term to referring to the Sudanese region of Africa, subhanAllah. So he was a man from Sudan, roughly, if we could say that, according to some narrations. And yet Allah says he was granted wisdom, he was wise, 
If you look at the beginning of the surah, you know some of the people who memorize the Quran, they are sometimes confused. Tilka ayatul kitab al hakim, tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. You know there are different surahs that start in different ways. This surah, you need to know Luqman was al hakim, so it is tilka ayatul kitab al hakim. You need to know that. This is a simple way of understanding and memorizing it and knowing the difference between the surah. He was a wise man, very wise. He came about. He was given some gift from Allah. What was the gift? The opening verses, Allah says, we are the ones who have given Luqman the wisdom. This means the source of wisdom is Allah. Just like the source of knowledge is Allah. And you need to know the difference between the two. If you have knowledge, it does not necessarily mean you are wise. And sometimes people are wise and their wisdom takes them further than those who have more knowledge than them because of the wisdom. So this is why it's very important to have both and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us wisdom. Like they say, knowledge is to know something and wisdom is to be able to deliver those goods to others in a way that makes it palatable for them to digest. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us both. You know, it's easy to know what's right and wrong, but sometimes it's not easy to convey what's right and wrong to people in a way that they are convinced that this is right and wrong. So may Allah make us people who are not only sharp and intelligent, but at the same time, who can handle situations, who know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, who you are speaking to, how to address them. If you look at the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is full of both knowledge as well as wisdom. May Allah grant that to us. In a few minutes, inshallah, I have in front of me perhaps 45 minutes to an hour. In, in that time, I'd like to go through what happened to this man and what he said that made him so important. He was given a gift from Allah. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا We are the ones who have given. Who? Luqman al-Hikmata. We gave Luqman the wisdom. And what did we tell him? Anishkur lillah. Saying, you should be thankful to Allah. Now, there are two points here. One is, when you have wisdom, you automatically thank Allah. And the other is, Part of the wisdom was that Allah inspired him to thank Allah. This means someone who is not thankful to Allah has no wisdom. And if they have no wisdom there, then they don't even have knowledge because part of knowledge would also require you to be thankful. If you do a good deed to me and I say thank you very much, Jazakumullah khair. As a human being, you feel acknowledged. Allah does not need the acknowledgement, but to give you more, he says, you acknowledge and I will give you more to show you that even amongst yourselves, if you acknowledge, you will prod the person or inspire them or perhaps incline them towards helping you more. So if you did someone such a big favor and they just looked at you and carried on, will you do it again for them? You need to have a very big heart, mashallah, to do that again and a third time when they just walked off, subhanallah. Or what if you did someone something good and they harmed you in return? They harm you. You know, you help a person, you build them a house, and next thing, they, they come and drive into your vehicle and say, this man, I'm jealous about the car he's got. Come on, he built you a whole house. He did you such a big favor. Would he do you anything else? The answer is no. So the minimum gratitude to Allah is that you do not do that which will anger him, which will upset him, that which, which is unlawful. If you engage in what is haram, you are actually being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So step number one, to stay away from, a, from that which is prohibited. Step number two, fulfill that which he has required you to fulfill as best as you can. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, if I have instructed you to do something or if I have prohibited you to do something, stay away from it. And if I have instructed you to do something, do it as best as you can. This is an amazing instruction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَانْتَهُوا If I have prohibited you from something, then stay far away from it. وَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ And if I have instructed you to do something, then do it as best as you can. This is a beautiful instruction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the instructions are plenty. We may not be able to fulfill every single one of them. The prohibitions are a list. You have no excuse to engage in prohibitions. May Allah grant us wisdom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him. Part of inspiration is that 
he be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? What does Allah say? Allah says, وَمَن يَشْكُرُ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ If you are going to show gratitude to Allah, by worshipping Allah, by fulfilling His commands, you will definitely find that you will benefit from it. If I show gratitude, I will benefit from it. Imagine, Allah gives me my nose, my eyes, I use my eyes in the correct way. Wherever I have faulted, I ask Him to forgive me. I use my mouth in the correct way, I use my hands in the correct way. I benefit as many people as I can and I try to be a good person. Alhamdulillah, I will benefit from the goodness. So who benefits when there is gratitude? We benefit ourselves to start with. And then Allah says, وَمَن كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Whoever wants to show ingratitude. Here the term kafara refers to ungratefulness. Someone who's ungrateful in any way, whether they have disbelieved, whether they have not worshipped Allah, whether they have worshipped gods besides Allah, whether they have been sinful, whether they have not fulfilled the obligations, all that in gratitude. Allah says, we don't need them, they need us. Ghani means independent. Allah is independent and he is full of praise. Whether you praise him or not, praise belongs to him. Whether you thank him or not, all thanks belong to him. Subhanallah. So this is why it's important for us to know what Allah says in the Quran. If you are going to turn away from the obedience of your maker, he will replace you with others who will not be like you. You don't want to read salah, the masjid is still full. You notice that? If someone misses Jum'ah and they are outside somewhere, is the masjid going to be empty? It's going to be full. Nobody will even notice that you were not there. Because Allah says, we replace you so quickly with someone else. If there is a good cause and you don't want to give your money, the good cause will happen without you. Someone else's money is going to be used in a good cause. Maybe your money might be used in a bad cause. So this is why it's very important to ask yourself, this good, am I involved? If I'm not involved, let me do something better. Let me try my best to involve myself in the goodness. If it is an obligation, make sure you are there. If you don't fast in the month of Ramadan, there are so many who fast even outside Ramadan. Do you know we have a sunnah fast, may Allah help us all to fulfill it every Monday, every Thursday. Try it out. If you don't try it out, there are other people trying it out anyway. But the sweetness of it, it's not a farad fast, it's a sunnah. The sweetness of it, you will only taste when you start. I have heard non-Muslims, I have heard non-Muslims say that they fast on a Monday and a Thursday because they have found how beneficial it is health-wise and they say they know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Islam, has taught this. But they say we found it to be very beneficial for our health. A professor, and I heard this on BBC, you can Google it and check. That's the biggest sheikh in the world, his name is Sheikh Google. <laughs> So you can check it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and may he grant us ease, really. The reality is there are people who are doing things and they are not even Muslims and they've learned from Islam. And we who are Muslimin sometimes are far from the Islamic teachings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may he guide us all. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained very clearly that if you are going to show gratitude it will benefit you you are not going to show gratitude you need to know allah is independent anyway and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely full of praise and the owner of all praise then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of something very interesting he says remember remember when luqman addressed his son saying the following now before we say what he said let me explain to you the word that is used, Bunay. Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ When, remember when Luqman told his son, Ibn, we all know means son, Fulan, Ibn Fulan, such and such a person, son of such and such a person, we know that. What did Luqman say to his son? Ya Bunayya. Wow. Why didn't he say, Ya Ibni, Ya Ibni? He didn't say, Oh my son, using the normal word, but rather he used a very sweet word. 
He used a word which depicts closeness. It depicts love. It depicts the tender age of this child. He's not just a son, but he's a young son. Bunay in the Arabic language is known as At-Tasghir. Tasghir meaning something that is used in a way that depicts many aspects of young age perhaps or you know making it smaller sweeter perhaps and sometimes in a fond manner you're speaking to them it shows love and affection this means he's telling a young son this is advice to the children as well and mashallah i do notice a lot of children who come mashallah and listen very attentively many of the brothers have told me you know my son is so small but he sits and he imitates you subhanallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness uh, the reality is this type of advice is for everyone. Even the young people who are seated here, this type of advice is for everyone, not just for the adults. And this is why he says, Ya Bunay, Ya Bunay. It could have been a brother that he was advising. It could have been a father, like the case of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He says, Ya abati inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tik fattabi'ni Oh my father, Ibrahim salam is talking to his father. Knowledge has come to me that did not come to you. So follow me and I will show you the path. Imagine Allah kept that in the Quran. How many of us, our children are trying to correct us, but we don't agree. We say go away. Well, Allah has kept it in the Quran. There is a statement which says, that Ibrahim tried to correct his father. When the father did not take correction, you see how he suffered. So if we don't want to take correction from our children, we will suffer, perhaps in a different way, but common logic. And in this particular case, the son is, is being advised by his own father. When you talk to your children, speak in a sweet way. Don't say, hey, come here. Why are you playing with that iPad? Oh, why did you buy it, father? <laughs> Today the children, mashallah, they want to play with things. But sometimes we are guilty of facilitating that for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Speak to them nicely. Ya Abu Nayy, oh my beloved son, you have an opportunity. And you speak to them beautifully. You talk to them. We are being taught here. This is advice for a Muslim. And this is why Allah kept it in the Quran. Revelation that is for us. Amazing. So when you speak to your children, be careful. Address them nicely. Be close to them so that you can tell them things. Some people have this cat and mouse relation so far from my, chair, my child that he is frightened to even greet me. He's frightened to even talk to me. Some people have that. I hope it's becoming less and less in the world because as much as you are a parent and you will remain a parent, but you need to have a close relation with your child so that when they have a difficulty and a problem, they trust you with their problem. And they know my dad is not going to just blow his cool and get upset with me, but rather he's going to help me. This is the attitude. So the first piece of advice, he says, oh my beloved son, remember one thing, don't associate partners with Allah. Yesterday we spoke about the purpose of creation. And I made mention quite clearly to say we are created in order to worship Allah. And we explained it from different angles. But to be honest, if you look at what we're saying today, the first point is, do not associate partners with Allah. If you do, you are foolish. Do not associate partners with your maker. The one who made you believe that he is one, he is singular. He is alone and he alone is worthy of worship. Nobody else is worthy of worship. You cannot worship a stick or a stone, an idol or a grave. Nor can you worship a top pop star. We've always said pop stars are called pop stars because they pop. You've heard that before. We don't worship pop stars. We, we don't, no. We have role models. Yes, that is correct. But remember role models. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the ultimate role model. From him, we take everything. Yes. From anyone else, subhanallah, like today, you might have a role model of your teacher or perhaps someone else who is around, you know, a respectable person. We need to take certain things and some things we excuse them because they are human beings as well. Say, for example, you've got a school teacher and to, to you, he's your role model. And on the other hand, you have a big businessman who's very successful, who's your role model. The businessman is your role model for his business and the way he has succeeded, perhaps. And your school teacher will be a role model in whatever he, can, he or she can offer you in terms of looking up to. But there will be aspects in their lives that you will need to discount 
Why? You see them smoking behind the wall. Oh, I'm not supposed to have seen that. You know? You see them sometimes. It can happen. They might. You see them in an angry moment. They say something. That is not something you follow. But the one you follow completely is Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You follow him completely. So here, Luqman is telling his son, don't associate partners with Allah. Be careful. You worship your maker. Put your head on the ground only for your maker. Do not allow yourself to be distracted. That is my advice number one. Advice number one to a believer. Please do not associate partners with Allah. No matter how enticing it seems. You know, fortune tellers, magicians, uh, those who are engaging in witchcraft. All this is association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are warned to say, lead your life. Come on, lead your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he protect us. So this man says, Inna shirka la Indeed, association of partnership is a grave sin. What is the meaning of zulm? If you look at the Arabic language and you open the you know, dictionaries and so on, you will find a very interesting meaning. Al-zulm, wad'u shay'i fi ghayri mahallihi. To put something where it does not belong. So you are putting worship where it doesn't belong and your core existence is because of worship. So that's the biggest loss. This is why it is called zulmun azim. It is a great sin, great wrong. Perhaps in the English language we would say a great oppression. To put something where it does not belong. You have put your head on the ground for someone besides Allah, besides your maker. How could you do that? And this is why sometimes the non-Muslims come to us and they tell us, why do you put your head on the ground for a black box in Mecca? And you tell them, no ways. We don't worship the black box, not at all. We worship the one who made us. That's it. Whoever made me, I say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. What is the meaning of Rabbun? You know, praise be to my Rabb who is the highest. What is the meaning of Rabb? Rabb is a me is a word in the Arabic language made up of three letters. Ra, Ba, and Ba. And it has a meaning that will fill three booklets. That's how deep its meaning is. I can give it to you in a little nutshell. You might have heard me saying it at the beginning of some of my lectures. All praise is due to Allah. Nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, creator, curer, the one in whose hands is lies the control of absolutely every aspect of existence that is only part of the meaning of Rabbun. Subhanallah. So we cannot associate partners with Rabbul Alameen, the one who created everything. That's who I worship. This is why Islam is the fastest growing religion on the globe. Because of the concept of Godhood and the fact that you plug in directly with your maker. Whoever made you, that is whom I call Rabb and I call him Allah and I put my head on the ground for him alone and I confess my sin to him alone and he is the owner of forgiveness and he is the one I will return to when I die. I call him, O oh, the worshipped one, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So now, if you take a look at the next piece of advice, after he started off saying, worship Allah alone, then he carried on. Why did he choose to start with this? Because the rest of it is a waste of time if the root is rotten, if I can use that word. You have a house you are building. Your foundation is very sandy. And then you want to use the, the strongest concrete at the top. It won't help. Your building will still come crashing. Your foundation needs to be concrete. Then you can enjoy building as high as you want. The deeper and stronger the foundation, the taller your building. Ask those in Qatar, they know. Subhanallah. Tall buildings, mashallah, we see all around. Look how long they take to dig before it comes above the ground. Once it comes up in a few days, you see, wow, this building is up. But it took them very long to dig going down. So this is what we say, your shirk, it is not supposed to be there. Solidify your belief in Allah so that your... Root is powerful. Then whatever you build is meaningful. Everything you do will be for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a powerful lesson that we learn. Then he says, And Allah has indeed ordained to man to be kind to both his parents. Wow. Imagine, one is Allah. And after that he is saying, You need to be kind to both your parents. Not just your mother, not just your father. But both of them. You need to be kind to them. 
Amazing. A question might come to a lot of people's minds. Oh, my parents are divorced, so who do I owe my allegiance to? Kindness does not stop because of a divorce. You need to be kind to both of them. Excuse your parents when one comments negatively about the other. You are a child. Excuse them. Your kindness is above. Your kindness is above the negative comments of one against another. You need to know this. Sometimes the weakness of man, parents are divorced. Or parents have got a problem and the mom comes, you know, your dad is a rotten man. So you say, right, dad, why are you rotten? Come on, take it easy. There's two sides to a story. You need to know that. Your mom's weakness is she involved you as a child in her mess. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Kindness does not stop at a mere comment. You don't. You're still kind. Your dad comes, you greet him. Minimum kindness is to greet him. To embrace him. If he tells you, my son or my daughter, I need you to do this. No problem. Get it done. So much so, even if they are disbelievers, the Quran tells us, that you still need to be kind to them. Amazing. Disbelievers, you are kind to them. The Quran is telling us, the only time you do not obey an instruction of your parents is when they instruct you to do something which is prohibited in the law of Allah. Someone says, you know what? Here's some money. I'd like you to go to the shops and buy me the latest French whiskey that you have. You say, dad, I love you. I'll bring you water. I'll bring you drink, I'll bring you juice, but not the whiskey, dad. Bad for your health. Whatever you want to say, say it. Because you cannot obey an instruction against the instruction of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why Allah says, even if they are instructing you to engage in shirk, you stay away from that shirk, but continue being good to them. Wow, subhanallah. Look at the wisdom, look at the advice. They are instructing you to do shirk against Allah and Allah says don't follow them regarding the shirk but continue to be kind to them so the statement of one divorced parent of yours against the other is far lighter than shirk imagine so Allah is saying if they are trying to push you into shirk do not listen to that but you must still be kind to them I'd like to say no matter what you've heard about your father or your mother Kindness is above the comments that you've heard. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is the advice to a Muslim. Amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors, grant us a deep understanding. Everyone goes through different problems, different difficulties. The rate of divorce is very high across the globe. It has increased over the last few years. And whatever the reasons are, it's not our topic today. But what we do know is some people are not kind to their parents because of a separation. Why did my dad do this? Dad, you were very bad. If you loved us, you would have stayed with our mother. For example, how do you know? Maybe because he loved you, that's why he separated. To allow you a decent upbringing. Instead of an upbringing with fighting and swearing every day. Maybe. So you don't know the other side. And even if you did know, try your best. If, if, you know, if they or if one party is totally ignoring you completely, it's a different story. But you as a child is supposed to still be kind. May Allah grant us goodness. Now I see we have a lot of adults here. And mashallah, we're living in a country where perhaps a lot of us are distant from our parents in terms of physical distance. So how do I fulfill the rights of my parents? Whether they are Muslim or not. We told you, that's besides the point. At this moment, we are talking of kindness to your parents. You pick the phone up tonight. Call your parents. Just find out how's your mom doing, how's your dad doing. If they've passed away, say a dua for them. The hadith says a child who makes dua for the parent is offering the parent a very valuable gift. Very valuable. Because the deeds of Banu Adam are cut when they die. Besides three things. And one of these three things is the dua of a child for the parent. The dua. Basic. You just ask Allah, Ya Allah, forgive my father. Repeat the dua every day. Ya Allah, for example... Grant him, you know, ease in his grave and what have you and so on. This is something that we are requested to do and it's something very beneficial for them. But today, if they are alive, call them. Some of us, we earn, mashallah, you know, Qtel change the name to Urid. Why? It means I want, doesn't it? Uridu, it means I want. I'd like to think that's what it means. 
What does it mean? Correct. Some are saying, no, it means Urdu. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, the name has changed and tariffs went down and the competition has increased and you have Viber and you have Vonage Mobile and you have so many other things. I don't want to advertise everything because, you know, people might think I have a 5% cut in there. But <laughs> the reality is, use it. Come on, it's become cheap. You can sit on WhatsApp all night, but you haven't WhatsApped your own father. One might say he's not on WhatsApp. Well, then phone him. Come on. Subhanallah. Make a phone call. Dad, how are you doing? He'll be shocked. My son, did something go wrong? Why are you phoning me? Did something go wrong? Allahu Akbar. Why? Because we are so far from our parents. Kiss your mom on the forehead. Tell her, my mom, I love you. Please pray for me. She might not be there tomorrow. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant them forgiveness. So it's very important for us not to undermine these type of acts of worship. It is an act of worship to keep comms with your parents. An act of worship. And yet we don't. Sometimes in the same city they are living, but we've never been to see them. We haven't you know, visited and so on. Uh, we've not even made an effort to call. Today you have, uh, we call it what? These video calls. People will call a spouse, they'll call a girlfriend, astaghfirullah, they'll call anybody. Hey, can I see what you look like? Wow, you're looking good. <laughs> Try your parents, they want to see you. You are a result of Allah's qudra and Allah's power. He chose for you those particular parents as a test for you, subhanallah. And yet, you're not even ready to communicate with your own parents? Come on. So I think, inshallah, we can all make an undertaking. Inshallah, those of us whose parents are alive tonight, We'll see the timing because, you know, it might be night somewhere else. They might be sleeping and say, hey, stop disturbing me. Put the phone down. So think carefully when you can at your earliest convenience, give them a call or visit them. Try your best. Say a word or two. And subhanallah, you set the trend and the pace. Let your children watch what you are doing because tomorrow they will do it with you. Let your children watch what you are doing. Tomorrow they will do it with you. Show them the excitement. Hey, we, today we're speaking to your granddad. Mashallah. Come, let's talk. One day, they will do the same with you. Wallahi, you will smile and you will say, Subhanallah, Allah has guided me. This is the advice of a Muslim. And we are sitting here speaking about it from Luqman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and bless all of us. So this is a beautiful statement that Allah says that even if they are trying to turn you away from the deen, you don't follow that. But you still keep on being kind to them. Because Allah says, to me is your return then I will inform you of what you used to do. This is showing answerability. Whatever you do, remember Allah is watching. Remember you will be answerable to Allah. You are and so am I. Whatever we do, we are answerable to Allah. I remember mentioning yesterday in both my talks that if you want to have a good meeting with Allah, the day He is taking account of our deeds, scatter your books with a lot of istighfar. Engage in much of istighfar. Ask Allah's forgiveness. Look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He engaged in istighfar so much. Yet, did he need it? He did not need it. But he engaged in it much. So that we who come after him can follow that example. One of the narrations says up to 100 times a day. He used to repent to Allah. Ask Allah's forgiveness. Sometimes a week goes by. We haven't yet repented once. We didn't think about it. Why? Because mashallah, we sleep, we get up, we go to work, everything is okay. The car, we have remote control vehicles, boom, you press the button and it starts waiting for us. The air conditioning unit is already on. You know, there are vehicles now. And subhanallah, everything moves. And so we had no need to turn to Allah. Astaghfirullah. Don't lose track of the fact that you are answerable to Allah. One day, He will show you what you used to do. Subhanallah. Long time ago, people used to say, how is Allah going to, how does he keep a record of everything? We do deeds for so many years, 50, 60, 70 years. Today, you have a small chip. They call it one terabyte. You come across it? One terabyte. You know how much that is? Perhaps 3,600 libraries full of books can go into that. One terabyte, the size of my nail. You can have that. Amazing. And now people are saying, what can I have in there? You can have approximately 36,000 hours of high definition videoing. Subhanallah. 
So for me to show you or for you to show me a CCTV on the side of a few days ago, it's recorded already in the system. So amazingly, why do we think we can run away from Allah? You know, once I was looking at something and it was a strange documentary where they were showing how people enter a lift and they, they look, is there a camera here in this lift? If there is no camera, the camera is a little bit hidden, then you find them doing silly things sometimes and so on. And you start thinking to yourself, people look to see if there's a camera before they do something wrong sometimes, not realizing that there is something more capturing than any camera that is on you 24-7. You cannot run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless us and grant us ease and goodness. Do good deeds. Do. Imagine you enter the palace of the Amir. And you know, you know you are being watched. Come on. From before you enter, one mile before you enter, you know you are being watched. So you know you, you're smart. You make sure you're smiling. You make sure you're okay. Why? Well, I'm being watched. I, just now I might be a person who might just get a commendation to say, wow, what a good man. You know, he's, and you're being good. Allah is watching you. So be even better. Allahu Akbar. Allah is watching you. So be even better. Let's move on with this advice. Beautiful advice where Luqman is speaking to his son. He's spoken about shirk, number one. Number two, he's spoken about parents and he's given details. Details of the parents. This also is a verse that is a revelation from Allah. If you read how it is worded, it's actually a revelation from Allah, an instruction for all of us as well. That is how it is worded here. Then he says, Ya Bunay, oh my beloved son. Amazing. What is he about to say? Exactly what I said moments ago, worded in a more beautiful way. Oh my son, even if it is something as small as the seed of a mustard, even if it is something as small as the weight of the seed of a mustard, and it is inside a rock, not on the rock or under the rock. Under the rock, you can move it and check it. Inside the rock, or as high as possible, or as deep into the ground as possible, meaning in the skies or in the ground, no matter how high or low, Allah will bring it forth. Allah knows about it. He will show it to you. He will bring it. He knows. So he is saying, you can never hide anything from Allah. He knows what is inside. He knows what is outside. He knows what is beneath, what is on the top, every direction. He knows absolutely everything. Keep on remembering this. This is the advice that Luqman has given. So I need to remember Allah is watching me all the time, no matter what I do. If I hide from my parents and do something, Allah is watching, He knows. And He knows that this thing will have a repercussion later on. Whatever He wants to do, it will happen. We need to make an effort to be the best of people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this is also a beautiful piece of advice. He says, Allah knows everything. He has knowledge. And He knows the intricacies, the small details. Today when you meet someone, you take them at face value. You see me, you say, MashaAllah, this good guy. I hope, inshallah. When I see you, I say, MashaAllah, good guy. You know, you look at the guy, he's a decent fellow. Alhamdulillah. We hope. But deep down, every one of us might have something we don't want someone to see. I have maybe a bad habit. Maybe I said something yesterday to someone that was not nice. If the world had seen that I said this to someone, oh, they would think, what is this fellow on all about? He's preaching goodness. You know, you're ordering people to do goodness and you're forgetting yourself. So sometimes what happens? Allah is so merciful that He shows what is good and He covers what is bad. One of the ways of calling out to Allah, O oh, you who has made apparent that which is beautiful and has hidden that which is ugly, that which is not beautiful. Allah's hidden it. This is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should know when you are conscious of Allah, when you have Allah in mind, 
He gives you the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in tattaqu Allah yaj'al lakum furqana. Amazing. O oh, you who believe, if you are going to be conscious of Allah, He will give you the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, between this and that. He gives you the power. It's called the, the ability given to a believer. It's like a firasa. It's like a certain type of an art, something given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you just see something and you think to yourself, I just need to be a bit careful here. Subhanallah. May Allah grant us that type of distinguishing power. Sometimes, you know, there is a business deal, lucrative. Let me give you an example. A man, and this is a true story. A man came about and told me, I can double your money. He told me, I can double your money. I said, okay, sit down. He was so happy. He thought I'm going to give him a lot of money. You know, yeah, I can double your money. I said, okay, sit down. He says, and you know what? I can even triple it. Now, he was sitting on a chair. I didn't want to tell him, now sit on the floor. You might say I can quadruple it, you know. But I said, okay, how? He says, you see, I've got the scheme. And he started speaking. And let me not get into the details of it. It's not our topic. But I want to raise a point. And he started speaking and telling me and telling me and telling me. And he says, you know what? I don't even want to cut from it. Don't worry. I looked at his clothes. I saw he had some tear on his clothes. I seen this man is dressed in a very inappropriate way. I asked him, brother, what car do you drive? He says, no, I don't yet have a car. You want to double up my money and quadruple to triple up my money? And you don't even have your, your own money. Where did it? Who are you trying to fool here? He says, no, but I'm telling you I can. I said, sorry, I'm not interested. He said, if you were a multi-billionaire, I might have thought you, you might have a business way of doing something. But what you're telling me does not make sense at all. Amazing. And he tells me, you know what? But I'm telling you, I can double your money. What a fool. What a fool. Subhanallah. May Allah grant us goodness. All of us who are seated here, I want to just give you a little piece of advice. When someone comes to you and tells you something that is too good to be true, be very careful. Very careful. So many people have lost money to Ponzi scams. You know, pyramid schemes. So many people. And it happens every single time. We hear the story, but we still give our money. It is greed. That's what it is. Don't do it. Your money, you work hard for it. Do not waste it in that way. Ask Allah, Ya Allah, give me the power to see what's right and wrong. And then inshallah, you'll be able. But that will only come if you are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's move further with this beautiful advice that Luqman is giving his son. May Allah's peace be upon all of us. Amen. He says, Ya Bunaya Aqim is Salata. Wow. The term Salah had to come in. You see? Although the Sharia at that time would have been different to the Sharia we are following now, meaning their type of Salah might have been slightly different, but it was called the prayer, the Salah. Oh, my son, establish your prayer. Pray constantly to Allah. In our case, do not miss not only your five Salah. But on top of that, try your best to offer voluntary prayers to Allah. Constantly remain connected to your maker. Aqimi salata. Oh my beloved son. Oh my beloved son. Do not miss a single prayer. Fulfill your prayer. Establish it. Aqimi salah. You know, iqamat salah is a term that is used to establish your prayer. That means to be firm on it. To do it with pleasure. We always say that some people, they just read their salah because they have to do it. When others read their salah because they want to do it. Very big difference between the two. Ask yourself, do I read my salah because I have to? Or do I read my salah because I want to? If you are reading your salah because you want to, Alhamdulillah, you have got to a higher level. And this is when, you know, when we go to sujood, we take our time. When we come up, we take our time. If you are in a rush in your salah, there is something wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He grant us ease. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَانْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ O my son, encourage people to do good. Enjoin that which is good. Which means, go out and promote goodness. And demote vice. That which is evil, discourage people from it. Tell them, look, this is evil. This is bad. 
don't do this. Speak to the people, communicate with them in a good way. When you have goodness, do not be selfish. Today we are Muslimin. Do you know, a lot of us have not even invited non-Muslims to Islam. Some of us are shy. We are so shy, we say, hey, you know, Islam has such a bad name. How can I invite this friend of mine? He's going to tell me, hey, you want me to accept Islam and you want me to make my life difficult just like that? So we are so shy, we don't even tell them, brother, there is something called Islam. In actual fact, if you study it, you will find it to be the best. You will find it to be the solution to all your problems. We're too shy to say that. Go and look at those who've reverted to Islam. At times, they are stronger than the born Muslims. And they are more passionate about giving the message to others because they know they were upon darkness. When they saw the light, it turned on so bright that they could see so much compared to what they had in the past, which was complete darkness. So this is why, do not underestimate the value of a small message that you give a person you work with or a person who might be in your company for whatever reason who is not a believer, even for a moment if you've said something, it is worth it. Can I tell you, you can get a DVD, you can get a CD, you can get a booklet, you can get anything, perhaps, and just give them to say, my brother, I just want you to know what I believe in. Please go through it, you will understand us better. That's all. That is the minimum you could do. More than that, you can actually sit and discuss. Remember to be very respectful. Remember to be very respectful. This verse is telling us, giving us advice as Muslimin to say, if you are selfish with your Islam, you are wrong. You need to convey it, not only to non-Muslims, but even amongst ourselves. We need to encourage each other to do good. And we need to demote bad in a way that people are convinced that this is bad. You know, if you have a child and you tell him, my son, do me a favor. That switch you see there is an electrical switch. Never touch it. What have you done? You have given him good advice. You have prohibited him from something bad. But some of these children, they say, my dad said, don't touch it. Let's see why. Let's see why. Now they start taking a pair of scissors and poking it inside. When you see it, you take them and you take the, the scissors away. Hey, don't do that. You know what's a clever thing to do? Go to Google. I told you he's a sheikh. And you can check some little clips of how people have been burnt because of tampering with electricity. Call your child. Just have a look at this. You show it to them once, they'll never ever go close again. And you watch the child. When other children come, they'll say, hey, you know what? I saw a clip of what happens to people who touch these things. Don't even go near. They'll say, no problem. They take it easier from their comrades than from us. So this means you thought of a way of explaining to them. But if you don't think of a way, you might tell them all their lives and a child may die because of electricity. They may, there are so many who have because of that, because you did not think of a good way to prohibit them from that evil. The same applies in the Sharia. The same applies in Islam. When you want to discourage people from bad, don't just go and blast them and start telling them how much they are out of the fold and going into the fire of Jahannam and all that, they will turn away from you and they'll still do what they're doing, just like the children. But speak to them in a beautiful way, explain to them why it's wrong, come out and convince them to the degree that they will then go and tell other people, you know what, my brother, I used to be there before, but believe me, that's not the path. Come and see what it's supposed to be like. Subhanallah. What a beautiful piece of advice. And then he says, Wasbir ala ma asabak. When something afflicts you, when something has reached you in terms of negativity, bear patience. Be forbearant. Be a person who actually holds on. Not everything, every time will be according to your liking. You might lose things in life. You might not be able to get what you want in life. That is why Allah has kept a paradise. And we've said this many times. What is the point or the value of paradise if in this world we were supposed to get everything we want? What's the point? Anything I want is here. So Allah says, I want to show you that this world is a place where you will never ever get absolutely everything you want the way you want it. But we have kept another place. 
if you are forbearant and if you bear patience upon what we have decreed for you in this world, then we have kept for you a paradise later on, which you will get to. And there, فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَيِّهِ الْأَنفُسِ وَتَلَذُّ الْأَعْيُنِ There, whatever your soul desires will be yours. Whatever is delicious to the eyes shall be yours. Imagine, the term delicious is used for the eyes. Do you taste with your eyes? The answer is no. In heaven, you will. Amazing. Whatever you look at, you know, wow. You know, sometimes you look at a cake and you say, hey, this thing is looking tasty and you taste it and it does not taste nice. It has deceived you, isn't it? But there, you look and as you think it tastes so, it shall taste. Amazing. Subhanallah. Allah make it easy for all of us. But this, we need to bear patience upon what Allah has decided for us. And this is why he says, this is something you need to follow. It is something you must be firm upon. Fulfill your prayer. Enjoin that which is good. Prohibit that which is evil. And bear patience upon that which has afflicted you, which has got to you in terms of negativity. That is what you need to do. You must do. Then he says, the issue of humility and humbleness is addressed. Why? My brothers and sisters in this world, when we have got things slightly the way we want it, sometimes we become arrogant. Sometimes, you know, you have a person, for example, very wealthy. If he's wealthy and he's arrogant, he needs to know that there are people who have more wealth, but they are humble. Allahu Akbar. If a person has good looks and they are arrogant because they think they are beautiful, you know, there are people who have better looks, but they are humble. So, this world is a competition. Competition in the sense to do good. فَاسْتَبِقُوا khayrat. Allah says, compete with one another when it comes to doing good. So if you think you are hot, there is someone hotter than you, but more humble. Wow. We've worded it lightly. Wording of the youth. If you think you're a big deal, there is someone who is a real big deal, but they are more humble than you are. Subhanallah. Down to earth. You won't even know. Someone sitting with you and you ask him, sorry sir, and he won't even tell you who he is. Tomorrow you find out this was the CEO of a huge company. Wow. He was sitting right next to me. I can't even believe it. Why? Because he's humble. And me, I've got five real in my pocket and I walk around, hey. <laughs> I'm the boss. Why? What is that? Allahu Akbar. So, so this is why Allah says here, وَلَا تُصَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Never turn your cheek away from the people in this arrogance. Me. I don't know if, if I did it right, but I... I <laughs> <laughs> Allah forgive us. Really, I'm just showing you. To say that this is what sometimes people do. They really turn their heads. Allah says, don't do that. Don't give your cheek to the people to say, you know, I'm bigger than you, better than you. No. The only time you will be better is when you get your book on the right hand on the day of judgment. Then you can say, wow. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allah says it in the Quran. Those who are given their books in the right hand, they will have the right to say and they will utter the words, Oh, read this book of mine. Wow, I'm so happy. On this day, I am the happiest. I have this happiness given by Allah that I got my book on the right hand. May Allah grant it to all of us. That is the day. But before that, we are nobodies. We are nothing. Really, we are nothing. The only difference is taqwa. This is why the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he clearly says, لَا فَضْلَ لِعَرَبِيٍ عَلَىٰ عَجَمِيٍ وَلَا لِعَجَمِيٍ عَلَىٰ عَرَبِيٍ وَلَا لِأَبْيَضَ عَلَىٰ أَسْوَدٍ and so on and so on. And he says, إِلَّا بِالتَّقْوَىٰ There is no virtue of an Arab over a non-Arab and vice versa. Or a black over a white and vice versa. Except by piety. You are close to Allah, you are higher. And the closer you are to Allah, the more humble you will be. It's a sign, it's a sign. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humbleness and humility. May He make us people who do not turn away from people just because of a little bit that Allah has given us. And the worst is he who doesn't have anything. He has nothing. But still he is arrogant. Wow. That's the worst. Neither are you intelligent. You know, some people, they think they are intelligent. And this we need to say it because when the young people are sharp, sometimes we haven't advised them. 
Some of our children are very clever, but at school, they make like they are it. They make like they are it, you know. They don't listen to the others. They make like they are a step above. We as parents need to make them, you know, calm them down to say, listen, you are coming out first in your class. Be humble. Talk to the others properly. You know, be good. So many people have come out first in class, but they found it hard to find a job. Do you know that? Wallahi. I know of people who, be who became top doctors, medical field, and yet they took years to find an appropriate job. Allahu Akbar. Good, good people. So this shows that, you know what? It doesn't mean you came first in class so you are above the rest. No! May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors, grant us ease and goodness. We need to be humble and we need to be down to earth. And don't walk on this earth with pride, with arrogance. Tread properly. So people say, look at that guy. He's so arrogant, he's driving a Lamborghini. No! Arrogance is not connected to the type of car you are driving. It is connected to your attitude. Even if you are driving a Corolla like mine and you have an attitude, you are arrogant. And if you are driving a Bugatti, I'm sure Qataris would know what that is. But your attitude is humble. You are not proud. You can be living in a palace and you can be the most humble person because you respect those who work for you. You greet people, you have a humanitarian feeling for others, that is humbleness. You treat people with respect, that's what humbleness is. Treat people with respect, that is Islam, and that is taught in the Quran. That is humbleness. So, what we need to know, how much wealth you have and what type of house or car you have, or clothing you have, is not arrogance. Arrogance is described in the hadith of Rasulullah as Rejection of the truth and despising people. Two things. The Prophet ﷺ says, when you mock at people and you don't respect them, it means you're arrogant. And when you reject the truth, when it comes to you, it means you're arrogant. Subhanallah. Because the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked Rasulullah ﷺ, when he says, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال حبة من خردل من كبر. He says, a person who has in his heart even the weight of a mustard seed of pride will not enter paradise. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were worried. They said, O oh, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we like our clothes to be neat and everything, you know, our conveyance to be good and so on. He said, that's not the pride we are speaking about. The pride we are speaking about is when you reject the truth and when you despise people. Two things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to respect one another as human beings and at the same time may He keep us humble. Then he says, towards the end of his advice, Luqman, the wise, he says, Oh my son, when you are speaking, in fact he says, when you are walking, walk humbly. And when you are speaking, don't raise your voice in a way that you're yelling at people. What are you yelling for? Calm down. Speak with a nice voice. When you talk to people, instruct them politely. You know, may Allah forgive me and may He forgive all of us. Sometimes we are guilty of raising our voice for no reason. Sometimes in the house, we raise our voice so badly with our own children. Yes, they are our children, but my mothers, it does not give you the right to yell at them. The environment of the house becomes so dark because you are screaming all the time. So you might say, well, they make me scream. They don't. They are a test from Allah. You are screaming. We need to calm down, all of us, with our children, with our family members, with our workers, with all the other people. Stop yelling at people. Speak with respect. Your own child, if they've done something wrong, you don't need to say, hey. You know, I don't want to show you how it's done because you might say we learned it there. But the truth is, we should not be doing these things. We need to understand at once. We need to understand at once, drop your tone. Yes, if you need to speak loudly because people need to hear you, it's a different thing. But when you are yelling and screaming unnecessarily, it is more like the braying of an ass, meaning the sound of a donkey, a mule. That's what the Quran says. The worst of sounds is that of a braying donkey, a, mule, a braying mule. You don't understand what it's saying. You know, it makes a noise. What is it saying? Don't know. 
makes a noise. What is it saying? Don't know. You see, we have a habit sometimes. Look, I'm going to say this. I, it has happened to me as well. May Allah forgive us all. Sometimes what we do, when you have a helping hand at home, and we want to call them, whatever the name is, you're calling them from three rooms away. Eh, and they haven't heard you. And then you call their name again. Eh, and they haven't heard you. You say, she's deaf. She's deaf. Allah gave you legs. You need to walk there and you need to say, Salaam Alaikum, please come here. She will come immediately. Who told you to scream from one side of the house expecting her to listen from the other side of the house? If you really wanted that to happen, install microphone and install <laughs> loud hailers in every room. So then you've got to say, please come here. She'll be <laughs> like the airport and like some of the stores. You don't need to scream. But we are foolish because we are all guilty. Sometimes from one side of the house, we scream to the other side of the house and then we get angry that she purposely didn't come. But hang on, the Quran tells you not to scream and yell, which means, in other words, take a little walk to where they are and tell them nicely with respect, look, I need you here, please come. It will help your cholesterol levels as well. You took a walk. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. You know, I have spoken about this advice. And really, I hope and pray that we can implement it as best as possible. May Allah forgive us for whatever we may have said that is a shortcoming. And whatever goodness we've said, may Allah help us implement it. My brothers and sisters, we all have homes. We all would like to live a happy life. Remember, there are pieces of advice. You can take them. If you fulfill them, you'll find a lot of calmness in your life. You find yourself very content. This is advice given in the Quran. And we need to know, let's be good with our children. And as parents, let us make it easy for them to obey us and to be good to us. We as parents, sometimes we expect our children to listen to us, but we are unreasonable. You know, sometimes the issue of marriage, for example, comes about, and we are so unreasonable with our sons and daughters, we don't want them to marry someone for some silly un-Islamic reason. Un-Islamic reason. And then we force them to marry someone whom they are not supposed to be marrying. They don't want. Daughter tells you, Dad, I'm not happy. I don't want. You say, you have to. You have to. You don't know how much goodness they've done for me. Come on. That's not Islamic. A woman is not there for sale that you've got to give her to those whom you owe money to. That was jahiliya. That was the ignorance. Believe me, if you have imposed on your child that she marry someone whom she does not want to marry, you have committed a sin. And this is one of the reasons why the divorce rates are so high. People are telling us, no, it's because of love marriage. Wow. Yes, we do agree that sometimes people do not know how to get married. But you as a parent, why did you not guide them from a young age of eight and nine as to how to choose a spouse so that the day they grew older, they, had, they could choose correctly. Now that they are old and they've made a choice and you stayed out of their lives, who is to blame that they've made a choice and they are fighting you for it? It's you to blame. You were too far away from them. You might have been trying to earn the millions and the billions, not realizing that one billion alone is enough for, ha for having spent time with your own children. Wallahi, it's a difficulty. And with us, we don't like to listen to advice. Sometimes we don't like it. When it hits us and it hits us hard at home, we still don't like to listen to advice. Let me give you an example of a man. An example of a man, and this example is only to draw the attention of ourselves. They say this man had his motorbike and he, wa he went out one day to sell the motorbike. So he passed his neighbor. Neighbor was an old man sitting outside. You know, old people, they like to sit outside in the sun and watch what's going on and so on. He says, oh, my son, where are you going? He says, I'm going to the market to sell my motorbike and I'm going to get so much money and I'm going to open a business. He said, son, say inshallah. Son says, for what? I'm going. Oh, did you hear that? What was his statement? He says, son, say inshallah. What's the meaning of inshallah? If Allah wills. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا Surah Al-Kahf has a beautiful statement. Do not say that you are going to do something tomorrow or in the future, whether it is near future or afterwards, without saying that if Allah wills, without hanging it to the will of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the old man says, say inshallah. He says, for what? I'm going. He didn't say it and he went. So he stood at that haraj, you know, that auction, and he waited with his motorbike for a long time and 
people came, they showed no interest in his bike and they were going and the day was almost over. Near the end of the day, one man comes and says, how much are you selling your bike for? He says his price. He says, okay, can I take it for a ride? He says, yes. He jumped on it, he went. He didn't come back. <laughs> he didn't come back. This man waited, evening came, nightfall came, midnight came, nobody came back. The whole auction closed, they told him, what are you doing? I'm waiting, the man is going to come with my bike. He waited. Following day in the morning, he started walking back home. He had to walk. No money, no bike. Now when he walks back home, old man is sitting outside there and he says, my son, you got your money. You know what he said? Inshallah, I took my motorbike. Inshallah, I waited at the, at the haraj. Inshallah, a man came. Inshallah, he took my bike. Inshallah, I gave him a price. Inshallah, he rode it. Inshallah, he did not come back. Inshallah, I'm walking here. Inshallah, I passed. He said, hey, what's wrong? What's wrong? He says, I regret. Inshallah is the word I should have said. He said, son, too late. When we told you to say it once, you didn't. Now you can say it a million times, it's not going to help you. <laughs> How? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May Allah open our doors. So we sometimes are just like that word. Or like that person who didn't utter the word. When we are told something, we don't like to listen. When it comes back to haunt us, we say, oh no. This should have happened and now we have a big mouth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Really, it was a good few days that I spent here in Doha. And I've really met some good people, mashallah. And I've actually uh, seen a lot of uh, people whom uh, I've perhaps met on the social networks. And it really brings a warmth to the heart uh, to see such numbers and so on. I see a lot of smiles on a lot of faces, mashallah. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, the warmth of the brothers and sisters here, the hospitality as well. And I will be leaving in a few moments, inshallah, straight for the airport from here. So I request you to allow me to walk out reasonably, inshallah, <laughs> by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And until we meet again next time here, we say, may Allah bless us all. And may he make us have benefited something serious from what we've said. Until we meet again, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa.